Hi, I'm Jeremy Dean. I'm the Director of Education at Hypothesis, and i um, just going to introduce our panel here a little bit in a little bit, but first I just want to tell you about the Hypothesis tool, which is a web annotation tool. It lets you uh, annotate uh, web texts, you know, HTML websites, uh, PDFs, EPUBs, uh, all kinds of digital texts. You can take private notes on these texts, make public comments, uh, or form reading groups and have discussions in those reading groups with a, with a group of folks that you've determined. Uh, we have Hypothesis users are everyday internet citizens, uh, but we also have some verticals where we're seeing a lot of traction for this technology in journalism, for example, scholarly communication, um, but most of all in education. So uh, the vast majority of our users are students in classrooms at the secondary and post-secondary uh, level. Um, most of them are in the humanities and most of our previous webinars about uh, using hypothesis in the classroom have been about humanities, uh, about English, uh, composition, history. Um, and so I wanted to talk science today. And so I've got some science educators that have used or are using hypothesis in the classroom. Um, and I'll just say briefly before I turn it over to them to talk about their experiences and their projects. Uh, one of the cool things about hypothesis as a tool, like I said, it's a general purpose tool. There are people using this all, all over the world in different industries, um, is that we have a broad range of scientific use, right? So we have the American Academy of Advancement of Science using a hypothesis powered annotation tool to pre-populate articles from the journal Science for use in the classroom. So these are grad students breaking down professional uh, publications in science to then get used in secondary and post-secondary classrooms to help students gain the literacy to understand professional scientific research publications. Uh, and then we also, at the other end of the spectrum, have climatologists uh, in the climate feedback group that are using hypothesis in the public to annotate and grade the veracity of uh, newspaper and magazine coverage of climate change. So professional scientists leveraging the tool to sort of become public intellectuals and uh, intervene in the debates. Uh, if, I guess we have to say there are debates about climate change um, uh, today. So really wide spectrum, professional scientists, but also school kids um, at, at, at very young ages. Um, and so, but today we have three uh, science educators uh, talking to us. Uh, we are we, Hopefully we'll have three, maybe four. We're sort of waiting for one. Um, but we have uh, Brian Bennett, uh, who is a biology teacher by training, has also taught chemistry and physics in, uh, in public schools in Indiana and elsewhere. Um, he's now an instructional coach, so he's been doing a lot of work around you know, digital tools in the classroom and science education, and he's in the Elkhart Community Schools. And he'll go first, but I'll introduce everybody uh, together. Uh, and then we have Craig Whippo, who's at Dickinson State in North Dakota, is a professor of biology who's been using Hypothesis for about a year now on a web-based textbook with students up there and has some really great ideas for um, how this tool can be used in, in the science classroom. And then hopefully joining us will be Elba Serrano from New Mexico State University, who's a professor, a regents professor of biology there. Uh, if she's not able to join us during the course of the webinar, Marion Martone, who's her good friend and collaborator, was very aware of the work she did with Hypothesis and will represent that. Uh, in, in any case, uh, Marianne is, um, is uh, our scientist in residence, I guess, at, at Hypothesis, a, a Hypothesis staffer, but also professor of neuroscience at University of San, uh, California, San Diego. And she'll be sort of responding, possibly impersonating Elba Serrano, <laughs> definitely <laughs> responding and leading discussion uh, afterwards. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, like Jeremy said, my name is Brian Bennett. I'm a biologist by training uh, for a K-12 school system in northern Indiana. Um, and I came across Hypothesis maybe two years ago or 18 months ago, right around the time it was starting and started playing with it myself and annotating the web and having discussions around different articles, things like that. And then um, in my AP biology class last year, uh, so I had 25 10th through 12th graders. Uh, and we were using the OpenStax textbook out of uh, Rice University. And for my AP class, I really wanted to push them um, into higher order thinking around the, the text itself, mainly because that content or set by the college board is just so vast and there's so much I had to cover that reading was a heavy component of the course. 
Um, and using an AP level text is written at a college level, especially the Rice University text um, was at a very high college level in some cases. Um, and I was working with 10th graders who were 15, 16 years old. And so we really had to support the reading that they were doing. Uh, so I used hypothesis a lot and I would go through their reading day to day or week to week. And I would annotate the, the article myself and I would leave tips or I would leave um, explainers or links to other resources that would be helpful in the context for that particular content. Um, and my students interacted with it that way as well. Um, and in terms of the, just the interaction level, we were doing a lot of other things. We were moving one-to-one -one with Chromebooks and then they had iPads in their hands. And so we were playing around with some of the uh, the technical limitations, trying to work around those. We were also in the Canvas LMS. Um, and so we were looking at the Hypothesis Alpha app. Um, and so a lot of what I did still centered around um, the textbook reading itself and trying to push students to think out loud in any of their reading, obviously. We would annotate it by hand on paper if we were using paper articles. Um, but really trying to drive Hypothesis as not only a reflection tool, but a conversational tool around scientific content at the high school level. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, Craig, you're up. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, share my screen here. Okay, so um, my name is Craig Whippo. I'm an associate professor of biology at Dickinson State University. And uh, it's a small four-year public institution in Western North Dakota. Uh, it serves a extremely rural population. Um, and um, I have been using Hypothesis for the last eight months in my introductory biology courses. And, um, let me just kind of go over why I'm using it. Um, one of the things that I'm working on is trying to get my students to move from student mode to the way scientists think and understand biology. And this is a big adjustment. And along the, these lines, um, the National Science Foundation and AAAS came out with a document um, called Vision and Change in Undergraduate Biology Education. And in this document, they made some recommendations towards uh, reforming the way introductory biology is uh, taught at the undergraduate level. And so, one of the recommendations is to focus in on a few key concepts and the and, and competencies. Um, and then another one is for the students to um, participate more in the scientific process um, so that they understand, you know, how scientists are doing science and analyzing science. And then a third goal of, of these recommendations is um, to help the students step into that community of scientists um, and, and do so in a such a way that, that it's not normally taught in an introductory biology course. Um, and then the, the fourth thing is this connection between math and biology, so making that uh, more explicit. And if we look at the way traditional biology textbooks are, are, are written, um, you know, as you can see in this slide, there's, you know, most of them are, you know, close to a thousand pages long. There's 50 to 60 chapters. They're just these encyclopedic volumes. And what happens in those textbooks is that the students are 
if they read, they're reading for these bold terms and just this sort of like rudimentary uh, understanding of the material. Um, but one of the things that's really surprising about these textbook is how much the figures do not focus on actual research. Um, so you can see that, you know, I've used this Campbell and only 7% of the, the figures in the textbooks are related to science. Everything else is sort of the, these, uh, you know, graphics that are explaining what's going on in the text. Um, and in response to these, these problems, um, a, a new textbook was published. Uh, it's integrated, Integrating Concepts in Biology. And I'm just going to bring you over to the home page here of the textbook. Um, so it's uh, written by uh, Malcolm Campbell and Chris Paradise. Uh, and it's an online textbook. It cost about $35 for the semester for the students. So it's fairly low cost. And it is organized scroll back up here in these themes so we can go over here oops so if you go to look at the chapter there are these themes uh, we start at the biological levels and then there are these big ideas in biology that it focuses on. And if we look at a reading, one of the things that stands out is that it's sort of structured like a real life scientific paper and that the figures or inscriptions are the center of the text. Everything is revolving around what's going on in those figures. So I looked at this textbook and I thought, wow, this is really cool stuff, but I'm not quite sure that my students are gonna be able to do this. And I, I, I knew that I had to get them to read the textbook before they came to class. And I, I struggled with figuring out ways to do that. And what I ended up doing was I said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make this, I'm gonna encourage the students to do the reading by having a daily reading quiz and in that daily reading quiz, they, the question is always the same. The question is provide convincing evidence that you did the reading for the day. Um, and then using group annotation, using hypothesis. So they do that the night before. Um, and this is kind of the workflow that I, I use for those annotations. So usually I try to do a set of trailblazing annotations for the students ahead of time. So in that I will, you know, post links to, to YouTube videos, YouTube lectures, um, I'll annotate things that I think are particularly important or things that I think that are confusing about the reading. Um, just kind of give the students that extra support they need to get through the reading. Then the students go through and then they annotate um, the, the reading assignment in a, a particular fashion. I'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, then I go back through before lecture and I reply to 
student annotations. Now, I don't reply to everybody's annotations, um, and I make it clear that if I don't reply to students' annotations, it doesn't say anything about what I think of their annotations. Um, I, I just I, I apply or reply to the ones that I think would be meaningful for the class to see how I'm replying to them. Um, and I always structure those replies in a positive way. So I'm not, you know, criticizing how the students are annotating. Um, you know, I kind of give them nudges in certain directions, but I don't say, hey, don't do this, this isn't right. Um, and then after every exam, I go back through and I grade student annotations for that unit collectively. Um, so I'm looking for things like, did they annotate every day? Um, were they annotating at a level that I would consider a college level annotation? Um, those types of things. Um, it's, it's extremely subjective. Um, so that's the workflow that I use for, for um, the student annotations. And then I, I, I provide them with a handout about what are the types of possible annotations you can do. Um, and I encourage them to tag. And so, you know, the students can annotate by looking up words and, you know, providing meaning. And I have a, a, a format that I'm specifically looking for in a definition. Um, they can, you know, post links to relevant news articles, images, video, or podcasts that might help the class understand the material. They can uh, annotate their confusions, and when they annotate confusions, they really have to get into what's the nature of their confusion. Um, an annotation that says, I don't understand this at all, isn't gonna go very far. I want them to say, hey, I don't understand this because I'm stuck at this particular point in the reading. Um, they can you know, put their opinion down, they can reply to other students, and then they can answer the, the reading questions that come with the textbook. So if you scroll down, they read the textbook, there are these review questions, and they can annotate those and answer those questions collectively as a group. Um, and then the heart of the annotation are these inscription analysis. So this is where they annotate the figures. And um, the major focus of lecture time are these figures. You know, and and it, it, when you read a scientific text, the scientific text doesn't describe how to read a scientific figure. And the only place that a student can really learn how to interpret a scientific figure is in a, a uh, communal um, group situation where, you know, everybody's struggling with what the, the figure means. And um, so this is the heart of the, the, what the students are doing. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just show you one student's set of annotations. Um, this student is uh, is one of the better annotators that I have. And what she does for like a figure is she will, you know, highlight the, the, the figure like this, highlight it, and she will make a simplified title. So a good annotation will make a simplified title that uh, of that, that figure, uh, it will identify what the research question was that the scientists were trying to figure out. Um, and then there's an analysis. And in that analysis, what I want the students to be doing is going in and explaining how the figure should be, be, be interpreted. You know, what do the, the, the colors of the, the graphs mean, what do, you know, what do the symbols mean, um, and uh, come up with some conclusion about what the figure is about. Um, and so, you know, this student 
and when students do this, they, you know, they don't need to do every single figure, you know, collectively as a group. They, every figure generally does get annotated in this way. Um, and ideally when they study for the exam, they are going to these inscription annotations because the exams in the class are all about these figures. Um, and so the way the exams are set up is that every reading, every, every exam question is exactly the same as the title of the chapter. Uh, so in this case, the, the exam question would be, how will communities respond to climate change? And the nice thing about this textbook is that it has a bottom line. It gives the answer to the question. So what the students have to do is they are given the figures for this assignment and they need to make a valid scientific argument that the bottom line is correct based off of those figures. So the idea is they can use these annotations to study for those exams. Um, so that's kind of how my students are annotating. Um, went over that. So that that the outcomes of of using hypothesis in my classrooms are I'm, I'm seeing less distance between me and the students. And I can come into class and we've already kind of had a discussion outside of class and those barriers are, are much less. Um, I'm seeing the students engage in the material in a more sophisticated way than they did with the traditional textbook. Um, before they were just looking for the, the bold words and a rough understanding of what's going on in the chapter. Um, for me, one of the biggest benefits of using hypothesis is that I can, I can get insights into how the students are thinking before we go into class. And I can say, hey, I know they're not annotating here, they're having trouble with this particular section. I'm gonna have to really think about how we go over that in class. Um, and then the, the, the fourth outcome is my students are certainly reading much more than they did in the past, which was my primary goal for using hypothesis. So that's kind of my workflow and my thoughts about uh, this tool. That's great. Thanks, Craig. I, I have all kinds of questions, but um, I want to <laughs> turn it over to Marianne to perform the role of uh, Elba oh. Serrano. <laughs> okay. um. Um, and then kind of take us into discussion. So Marianne, whatever you think you can cover from uh, what you remember about Elba's projects uh, would be sure. great. And uh, I taught one more year after I joined Hypothesis. And so uh, I mostly taught graduate um, level courses and uh, in neuroanatomy and then also medical students. And I did use Hypothesis to annotate uh, readings so that people could look at them, but um, not getting students to read ahead of the class is the bane of education all the way. Uh, up through graduate <laughs> education, medical students you don't have to worry about because the, they're a whole different ball uh, ball game. But uh, I would have, I think, used it more for that purpose. And I'm I'm very you know very um, impressive use of hypothesis. Um, but Elba Serrano is a close colleague uh, of mine. We've known each other for many 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 years. And when I joined Hypothesis, I immediately reached out to her because uh, she teaches at, at New Mexico State. Uh, again, it's a, it's a postgraduate institution, but it is mostly uh, first generation uh, immigrants and um, most of the ones are the first time that anyone has ever gone to college. And I know that one of the big things that Elba has been involved in and has been extremely successful at is really trying to encourage them to engage uh, in science in STEM fields. but doing this by in many ways demystifying science and sort of taking it a little bit off of its pedestal and allowing students to engage with the uh, literature 
uh, in ways that doesn't just look at the content, doesn't just look at what it is that the scientists are saying, but how is the scientist, how did the scientists do this work, right? Who are their colleagues? Who are their networks? What other techniques do they reference? How do they assemble a set of tools and techniques? How do you get training in this? So I know that some of her early uses of it were really to help students look deeply at a scientific article and not just at the content of it, but the things that are sort of behind the article. Uh, and uh, being able to have people annotate, look for specific things, ask questions inside of the literature, this is mostly the primary scientific literature that she's looking at, was extremely important. I also know that the last project that uh, we discussed, I think she presented at the Society for Neuroscience either last year or the year before, was again in this process of demystifying and looking critically at the scientific literature, uh, the National Institutes of Health and other regulatory agencies have been issuing new guidelines in response to the fact that reproducibility in science is not uh, what it uh, could be or should be. And uh, she used hypothesis and other rubrics to allow students to engage in the primary literature and specifically take NIH guidelines or other guidelines about what constitutes good science or rigorous science, I should say, not good science, but rigorous science, and apply those to scientific articles so that so that the the students could go and look and say are they making their data available is there are the statistics appropriate right did they use proper controls did they use blinding did they use male and female mice you know all of these types of things so i think again that even though she's dealing with postgraduate education uh mostly the idea that this really fosters a more critical examination of not just content, but the process of science itself is something that's extremely important. I think also having lived through, as Jeremy has, the different phases of hypothesis, uh, when Elba started, you could either put things in public or you could put them in private. There was no idea of a private group. But I think once the idea of the private group came out, it allowed them to sort of open up the sorts of things that they, um, were felt free to discuss, they felt free to reveal ignorance and other sorts of things in ways I think that, that they were a little bit reluctant to do when they were annotating purely in the public sphere. But uh, Elba and I, in various uh, you know, conversations we've had, said you know, there are some interesting possible uses of hypothesis in the sense that it does open a channel of communication with the authors of these papers, and that at some sort of future time, uh, scientists, this has been my primary role at hypothesis, is how scientists use hypothesis for research. How do they annotate things inside of the literature? How do they extract information uh, and structure it so that it can be used uh, in databases? And the ability to sort of uh, reveal these public annotations, combine them, engage in conversations with authors themselves has been something that we've wanted to explore for a long time. Because again, I think it helps to humanize, it helps to connect uh, students who may be far away from the big research centers uh, with things that are going on um, at these universities. So I know that's uh, only the tip of the iceberg of what Elba actually did, <laughs> but uh, I hope that gives you a flavor. And I hope I was accurate. I'm just disclaiming that Elva had anything to do with this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. Um, do you have some questions, Marianne, or do you guys have some questions for each other? Um, I think we can move into the discussion part at this point. So my first question is, I, I wanted to hear a little bit about any student feedback and what the students actually thought of, of using hypothesis uh, and was wondering if you'd be willing to share those. So maybe just call on Brian first and then Craig. Yeah, I think for me at a high school level, this is not so, you know, we're not, def mm -hmm. how do I say this? We're definitely not at the rigor of graduate or postgraduate right, right. scientific work. Um, and so it was more of a training process for my students to, um, when we take something, like I think ignorance in science is something that any scientist is willing to admit. Like I have no idea you know, mm -hmm. what is going to happen in this context, but based on my background research, I can form a valid hypothesis and then I can test it from there. And so for a high school student, that's really hard for my students to admit, especially at an AP level where they're used to working at a very high level for a grade and trying to flip that around to this is how science works, right? Um, and so Marianne, what you said a minute ago was in using hypothesis for research to evaluate methods and systems. 
Um, I used Hypothesis in conjunction with Unpaywall. If you're familiar with that, it, it, it has open access research articles because um, I don't have access to major databases. I don't have access to journal subscriptions, right? So I would grab these research articles and publications and we would do things like analyze the methods if they had lined up with something we had done in class. Um, for my students who were college bound, my juniors and seniors, they saw the connections and I've actually got an email back from one in particular um, at Purdue University and he said that was so helpful. Um, like going through those and seeing the annotations and, and having you interact with it and um, having, you know, having an opportunity to ask a question of why did they do it this way and bringing those discussions out of the digital into the classroom space was also helpful for them. So it wasn't just this, you know, academic exercise for something that we just did because it's available, right? Um, and for me, making, being very intentional about making those connections helped my students see the process of science and is a, a long-term process from what research has been done, what's been published about it, how do I take these publications and how do I evaluate them, how do I tie that into what my question is so that I can move forward. Um, that kind of primary exposure uh, was really, really powerful for them. And I could see their growth as we went through the year and they practiced these skills um, over a long period of time. Um, and so I was able to walk out of that class knowing that I had done something to prepare those who are interested in sciences um, as they get into the college level. But it was definitely a big transition for a lot of them. Um, Craig, do you want to give us some idea of what the students thought? Um, the, the, the feedback that I've received from my students have been mostly positive. <laughs> um, I, they, they, they certainly like the, the, the feedback that I give and it's, it's, you know, they get a, a email when I annotate, mm -hmm. when I reply to their text. And I think it, it has a, almost of a, of a social media dimension to that. And so they get that little buzz when it's like, oh, you know, the professor replied and then it, it makes them, it gives them a little reward. Um, <laughs> so they, they, they seem to like that. Um, and, you know, I've heard students say, you know, where they're, they're out with their friends and I've replied to an annotation and they get it and they're excited that, and they tell all their friends, hey, you, you know, so that <laughs> they really like that. Um, there's a difference between this semester and last semester. Um, so I started last January um, and I had already had the students a semester prior. Um, and incoming freshmen right now are just beginning to figure out how to do it and there's still some grumbling going on but at the end of the spring semester last year everybody was was on board and um you know i i had very high success rate in the class and uh you know i think it it hypothesis was part of that and the students did seem to to respond to it well I think Jeremy there are some questions from the audience do you want to go to those I could I just unmute myself yeah um, yeah there's a couple questions here um, the one is uh, I'll, I'll just throw them out together actually one is what recommendations do you have for using hypothesis in a completely online environment which I don't think either of you are in but maybe we could just sort of uh, hypothesize um, and then Brian I can't remember I know that you there's a question about the use of hypothesis in canvas I know that you played with it or got it started I don't think it got off the ground but I know you yeah. tried pitch because we were at InstructureCon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> together so yeah. uh, Online environments, but also maybe specifically Canvas. Uh, even if you haven't done it, like, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So for the Canvas um, piece, we did. We had the alpha version, so it was very, very early in the development process, and we were running into issues where, just as on a functional side, um, it used an iframe embed, and on a Chromebook, it was this dinky little space, right? And so the the experience wasn't great for my students in that sense. Um, I also wasn't grading my annotations because I really wanted them to just get into the scientific habit of doing it. Now, the wisdom behind that, I don't. I'm, I think if I had graded them, it would have been done more. But I didn't want to put 
like you should do this because it's graded. I wanted them. You should do this because this is. Um, if I had to do it again, I might grade it. Um, I don't know. So the, the didn't really get into the Canvas aspect. I am though starting a course with some teachers in my new coaching role. Um, and hypothesis, one of our initiatives in the district is to improve reading and writing fluency at all levels. And this is something that we would use at the higher um, grades, nine through 12 mostly, um, as part of the annotation process within that. Um, and so playing with it more through Canvas is something on my list of things to do, um, to see how stability has changed, to look at different devices. and. Um, uh, so I don't have a whole lot of experience in what you can do and can't specifically do from that canvas aspect. Um, and I've never, I've never taught fully online, but I think along with, with anything, you know, it's part of the toolkit. Um, and Craig, if you're, you're much more rural than we were an urban district, right? So we see, um, day to day, um, but in conjunction with other online tools, it can be very helpful because it can expose the, the thinking processes that my students are going through, right? If we teach them to be honest about ignorance, you know, um, or honest about what, what problems they're having in the context. And that was the biggest piece for me is I could see those problems in context of the reading or in context of what we were doing. Um, and that helped me address those issues in context. Greg, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, I, I don't teach online either. Um, one of the things that, that I struggle with in hypothesis is how to get the students to respond to each other's annotations. And if I were teaching strictly online, I would want to figure out a way to encourage that behavior. Um, in terms of, of what I'm doing in the classroom and the focus on interpreting these figures, um, I think hypothesis would be a good tool for that. Um, but again, you'd have to figure out exactly how to create that space. And I haven't quite figured that out yet. I think that's dead on though, just from my experience with um hypothesis getting used in fully online environments that you really have to lean into that uh, discursive uh, piece. I mean, I do believe that uh, hypothesis is an incredibly social tool and about as close to like a genuine uh, class conversation as you can have in a kind of electronic uh, space. So I think it's a great tool for even in an entirely online class. Um, but I think Craig is, is pointing to the beginnings of how you'd want to really structure that around just pushing that social element because you're not going to have the class to sort of follow up on the annotations. So Craig is doing this with uh, his, with his you know, face to face class, but the fact that he's following up so much with those students and they were getting that thrill of a response. Clearly that piece would also be super important in a uh, fully online environment because then you again, you're emphasizing the social uh, piece, both for peer to peer, but also uh, student to teacher. And I think, you know, a lot of the things that Craig mentioned, I, one of his lines was breaking down the distance between student and teacher. Um, that's obviously going to happen more uh, in an online space because the distance is even, I would say, perhaps even greater. I don't know if that's actually true now that I think about it, but yeah, I, I would say it's probably greater online. You have, you know, feel farther away from the teacher. You don't have as much of a human interface and this can provide that. Um, I want to say one thing about grading annotations. It is true that there's a grading piece uh, in the Canvas app um, that will probably be in other LMSs. I forget what Dickinson is using, um, uh, Craig, but probably be in other apps for other LMSs. Not a requisite piece of it, um, but it is there. The real sort of heart of the Canvas apps and the other LMS apps is just to get hypothesis up and running, running natively um, to, so that you don't have to use the Chrome extension or something like that. Um, but while we're there on the issue of grading annotations, um, I'll, sorry, Marianne, I'll just ask a quick question. Craig, can you talk a little bit more about the grading piece of this actual grade of annotations? So, my grading is, is, is extremely subjective. Um, and you know, this is being recorded, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my students. My, everything that I grade in the class is subjective. 
Um, and it's basically a five point scale. And so a zero would be a student is doing middle school or high school level work. Um, and so they're, they're, they're just coming in and they highlight and they annotate you know, one word and they put a definition down or they have some question that tells me that they didn't bother to do the reading. They're just going through the motions. Um, a one would be a poor quality annotation um, or a collective body of annotations where the student is coming in, you know, one time a week. It's, it's a, it's an adequate annotation. It's not spectacular. It doesn't really contribute much to the community. Um, a two would be a C level work. It's average level work for that grade level. Um, the students are trying, they're, they're coming in, but they're still playing teacher games where this is a, 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 an exercise that I've got to get through. Um, and if I do, one or two annotations and I pop in and I pop out and I'm done. That's, that's passing, um, I, you know, a, a three would be a B level work. This is good stuff. The students are answering those questions that go along with the textbook. So the textbook has those, those, those questions in it. They're trying to answer those questions. They may be annotating a figure every now and then um, but collectively, they're doing good work. It may not be consistent all the time, but it's good work. And then a four would be A-level work. And an A-level student is annotating those figures. They're analyzing those figures. They're truly operating as a college student. And th that's how I, annot how I grade. It's, it's, it's subjective, but there are criteria um, that that the students you know are aware of you know and kind of to tie into that right you know when i was introducing annotation a lot of the early ones for me, and i wish craig that i had had mine do figures much more than we had done the text is i, I love that and that's something i'm going to share with the science teachers i work with now because that's in particular at the AP level, right, every long response question requires a figure of some kind. And so we did a lot with graph interpretation and analysis and construction. But anyways, um, I think I saw improvement, significant improvement, if they paid attention to what I was doing as a model, right? Um, and so anytime I made some kind of annotation, I tried to make sure I linked out to something else or included some outside or tried to pull in seemingly disparate ideas and connecting them in that context. And so I think, Craig, you called your trailblazing annotations, right? When I would do my pre-work or their pre-reading, essentially, marking up that text for them, paying attention to what I know are going to be confusing points or points of confusion for the students just consistently year to year, that's what they are. Um, making sure to draw those out and have quality annotations there that either prompt them to respond or prompt them to think differently about the content. Um, so I, I don't think there were more questions, were there? One question I have, because I was looking at your students' magnificent annotations and the effort that she put into, this is for, you know, Craig, put into those annotations. And of course, uh, Hypothesis mission is to enable a conversation over the world's knowledge. And one of the reasons we keep promoting annotation, of course, for scientists is that they can share their knowledge over these uh, papers with other scientists. Do you as teachers have, do you regularly um, share work between classes or between years? Is that something that um, is desirable or how, do, how does that work? <laughs> I, I've been thinking about this issue. Um, I think for my freshmen, what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get them used to a way of being and not sharing and being private allows them a playground to do that. Um, and so I'm thinking as these students move through the biology program of incrementally making their annotations more public. 
And so th then what they're doing is they're, they're making a product for the world. And I see that as, as uh, more in line with what I'm trying to do in the overall biology program here. Um, and so in, in upper level courses, we would be moving away from this textbook to the honest to goodness peer review literature and making those sorts of figure analyses more public there. Um, so the, the workflow that I'm thinking of is, you know, as a sophomore junior level work, they would be maybe going to like AAAS is science in the classroom and annotating using hypothesis those articles that have already been annotated before or kind of using that as the step next step towards learning how to read a peer review literature or going through those science the science in the classroom articles and looking for the the rhetorical elements that are used in those so annotating that way that that's more um of a rhetorical analysis um because the the science in the classroom they're already annotating the figures the students will have already done that in introductory biology so they kind of have an idea okay this is what the the annotator did now i can go in and i can i can look for those rhetorical elements that make that paper persuasive. And then as a, a junior and a senior, they would go into the peer review articles and annotate and look for those rhetorical elements and analyze figures and, and put them out in the world for the world to see. Yeah, I kind of see both sides to it. I think I, when I started with my students, it was prior to the groups. Um, so everything we did was in public. Um, I think it makes it easier for me too then because if it's a public annotation, I can reach out to someone I have a contact with and say, what are your thoughts? Can you help my student with this? And it's already there. But I also, and Jeremy, this came up in the, the instructure con discussion as well, right? If I want to use the same article or the same teaching piece between group to group, right, I would like to keep one set away from another set so they're not biased to one direction or the other as we're building up the capacity. Um, I don't know, it, and this is a, it's a struggle for me because I, I, I value open knowledge repositories, right, and so seeing the history of annotations, I think, can also provide a launching point. And if I were to go back into a classroom, you know, being critical about what text I'm choosing and what context is important, right? So if we're going through the, um, the practice stages, if you want to call them that, building analytical capacity, right? I can see the value in a private group setting. So we have a clean slate and we can work on that as a group together. But then, like Craig said, scaling it up, um, if we're looking at graduate or college level where we're contributing to the scientific community at a high school level, right? Scaling up is just getting used to being a good digital contributor <laughs> um, in, in any sense. And if we definitely have students who are interested in internships and things like that, that they are building up um, a good footprint for themselves in the annotation realm. Um, because now that it's an open web standard, right? There, this is something that could go into that, um, that you know, that digital profile of right. the body of work that they have present on the web. Yeah. I just want to follow up there because I think uh, the, and we've talked about this extensively, Craig and I, uh, or we've talked about it before. It's not just the public, the private to public thing, right? It's not just scaling up to public, although clearly culminating in public intervention in the scientific uh, community is sort of the, the, you know, the climax, the, you know, the end point of it, right? When graduate students are suddenly, you know, publicly annotating on journals that have embedded hypothesis and talking back to the article or other scientists are doing it, right? In a public discursive way. But it's also the different skill sets. I mean, I could, I could see us talking in a year, <laughs> maybe with an NSF grant or something like that and having mapped out and scaffolded from ninth grade through graduate school the different specific skills that we're looking for in annotation and, and how we're prompting students to annotate and what they are um, demonstrating in their annotations from ninth grade biology all the way to like a senior biology class and you guys have touched upon this but you know there's a different stages of that literacy and I think you could really evaluate it or you know 
see it, witness it, however you want to put it. It doesn't have to be evaluated or surveilled, but you could, you could witness it from you know, a portfolio. And this is what we talked about with Craig, was that if Craig continues to work with hypothesis year to year to year, and some of those freshmen, I guess the, the students you're working with now from the beginning of the year, right? If in four years from now, they will have uh, demonstrated, uh, they will have a profile portfolio, whatever footprint you want to call it, that you'll be able to look back on and that they'll be able to draw from themselves. One of the coolest things I'll just add from seeing those, the, they really was a really pretty remarkable annotations that the one student that you showed was doing um, is that she has access to that stuff. They you know that's part of her archive of uh, thinking and writing with hypothesis um, moving forward from that class to the next class and next class and maybe to grad school at New Mexico State University too with Elba. Shout out to Elba. <laughs> I think she's trying to join but her computer is <laughs> Oh no, oh no. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can figure out a way to record her and splice her in somewhere. That's it, that would be very good. Um, yeah. Uh, so yes, I was also thinking again that it's not just public to private, right? Oh, there's Alba. <laughs> hey, Alba. Um, that it's it's the being ability to share from student to student, or as you say, track your sophistication as you go through on uh, even courses to to say, look at my annotations now versus what they were when I was a a, a teenager. I think there's all kinds of interesting uh, sharing mechanisms. So Alba. I gave my view of what it is that you've done, and it's probably okay. completely different than what you actually did. Um, so, <laughs> but I did talk about rigor and reproducibility. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and learning the process of science. So maybe we'll just turn it okay. over to you for the last few minutes so you can give the yeah. real, the real I, overview. <laughs> I'm so sorry, digital technology. I, I'm very sorry. So just, just to, I did prepare a little presentation, and I'm going to call out a few of the slides. Um, I'm sure Marianne said pretty much what I'm going to say. Um, and so, can you see my screen? Hello? Uh, you're not sharing yet. Okay, there should be a, a little green okay. uh, icon in the middle of the bottom okay, sorry row about there. That. That's fine. Uh, let me um, find a lot meeting Zoom. Where'd the meeting go? Hmm. Oh, here, down here. Sorry. I am new to all of this. Sure. Uh, there's an outcome, share, share screen. Yep. Great, okay. So probably that one's mine. Um, do I click on mine then? Yes, share yeah. screen. Okay, great. Can you see it now? Yes, 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 yeah. there it is. Okay, great. So I, Why I'm hypothesis? Not, okay, I'm not going to do the projection. I'm just gonna go ahead and take you through it. So great. essentially, if you or ever have taken a graduate science seminar, we read papers, and they tend to be dreary discussions. One person reads the whole thing, and the, yeah, somebody's laughing, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And everybody checks in for 50 minutes of not much happening. So when I saw hypothesis, this seemed to me the perfect solution to engage everybody. So essentially, um, I use Bloom's taxonomy because I'm a professor, so I have to set up some pedagogy. I'll come back to that if there's time. We can just share the slides after. So what we do in the class then, I tried this in two classes, disorders of the nervous system and neurogenetics. And these were classes that had students from multiple majors. So there was the opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration and conversation. And so they set up the account. And then I will tell you now that the students preferred working in a group rather than public blogging. They were very uncomfortable by the public blogging although there is a public page that I can show you and I'll come back to that in a second. So, um, so what they did then is uh, I opted to tell them just paste the PDF link as a URL and then it was a simple assignment. Two things they had to do. They had to post seven items. Five were comments and the comments were specifically evaluate rigor and reproducibility in the paper. Things like statistical power, did they give you enough information to replicate the experiment, et cetera. And then questions. So they could ask each other, hey, I'm not an engineer. What is this um, AFM they're talking about? And then they confirm the completion of the task. The outcomes were beyond expectations. It completely engaged the students. They filled in knowledge gaps for each other. They had lots of impromptu conversation, and I experimented doing the annotation in class as well as outside of class, and both of them work. So this changed the science paper from something that you endure 
to a dynamic conversation. And I'll see if this link will work. This is the public link. Um, I can, uh, maybe I'll, I'll do that later if there's time. And so then, um, so that's what I did. And there is an example I can show you. But before I sign off, because I know we're nearing the end of time, for those of you who are teaching, there take is- your, Take your time, Elva. We'll, we'll come over a little bit. We start a little late. Yeah, take oh, your time. Okay, good. I want to make sure this story okay. gets told. It's a huge piece of the overall yeah, story. I, yeah. I mean, I'm very excited. And I'll tell you, okay, so let me see if I can just show you the page. The page was amazing what they did. We actually picked a paper before it became super hot. There are multiple papers, but this is the one they did publicly on the connection between psychological state and the microbiome. <laughs> that was the paper they annotated, which is something that has a, a lot of interest now. So hopefully the page will open in a second. Um, while this is opening, and I'm not sure why it's not opening more swiftly. Let me just copy the link, sometimes that works. I had so many technical problems today. At a certain point, I felt like the force is just not with me on this one. Okay, here it is. Yeah, you made it. Yeah, I did. The computer decided to do a system update. I, it, it, I had done this. Anyway, I won't bore you with computer details. So I think you guys are over here on this. So this is a page, I'm moving you over. So this should open up. Psychobiotics and the pursuit of happiness. We should all be interested in this topic. Uh, we truly are what we eat in more ways than we like to think. Oh, but I but, think we're, yeah. just, we're just seeing your uh, PowerPoint right now. So, okay, so I have um, to go you back just share to application. So if you share your desktop, you can move things around. I'm going to do Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Meeting controls. Huh. That's not open. Probably gonna have to unshare screen and share uh, like a different sort of window. But you could also just drop that into the chat. I'm trying to open up Zoom again, and it's not giving me that window. Zoom oh. cloud meetings. Now it's asking me to join the meeting again. What's? I can't. Meeting see. channels. Oh, that's pretty meta. Okay. Hold on. I think when you're sharing your screen, uh, Zoom kind of- Let me of stop share. Thank you. Okay. you. There you go. <laughs> that was an experienced blog person. Let me put the screen where I want it and then go back. And thank you for that tip. This is my first webinar. So I'm learning a lot. Wow. You're doing great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, share the screen. I'm assuming it's this one, the desktop. Is that it? Yes, you're seeing my desktop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Can now you see I it see. now? Okay. Yeah. Yep. No, I do not want to leave the meeting. Okay. So here is, let me go back. Um, this is a public one. So we can go here to the annotations. These are people who came in. I don't know when. They weren't in the class. Here's the annotations. Here are my guys. Biomedical dude was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's not showing here, let me see if I can see the highlights. The color yeah, you, is hot for some reason. Anyway, you turned they, off the highlights, the little eyeball just to the right yeah. of that black strip. Yeah. Yeah. Any, um, the eyeball here. Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. There we go. So they would highlight and make comments. And so this was the kind of discussion they were, some of the, some of the, um, were just like statements, symbiosis. And then they would really get into it at a certain point. Um, and so she's asking, she's a nurse practitioner who took a master's with me talking about um, causes for diseases, et cetera. Mansi talked about uh, concepts, keywords. So they basically go in and they say different kinds of things. They blog and comment in different ways. This student really got into it. Um, and it was just fun. And then in class, and then I read about altered osmotic pressure. So they start having a conversation online that they follow up afterwards. And this link is publicly available if you want to browse it. And this was an example. They shared shared videos, which is kind of fun because you can drop in other kinds of information as well. And they can, and it was fun for me to participate in this. It enriched the paper for me as well, which of course is important for us to feel that we are part of the learning process. So can you see my PowerPoint again? Yes, okay, good. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about that. I'm kind of out of sequence. What I do want to say, have you talked about uh, assessment at all? 
Probably not enough. Tell us your thoughts on it. Just okay. a little bit, yes. Just a little bit. So for those of us, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm coming in late, but I assume that many of the participants are professors. We have to do assessment for our portfolios, and we do it for good pedagogy. So when I designed it, I used Bloom's taxonomy. It's straightforward. We use it. And I keyed in on understand, analyze, and evaluate as three of the parameters that this would um, facilitate learning in. And since then, I have found on the web a lot of discussion of digital Bloom's taxonomy. And so I have some links here for you. I gather this is probably very prevalent in the schools, uh, high schools, not so much in universities. I'm one of few scientists who uses this. And so this is really cool. It took the original Bloom's, the revised Bloom's, and then the digital Bloom. And a lot of hypotheses maps nicely onto this, playing, operating, editing, validating. And this is exactly what my students were doing. I just showed you, they linked, they validated, they um, did media clipping. So it really is very much in alignment with digital literacy. And then the final uh, link I'm gonna give you in terms of assessment, I found this last night, an individual named Andrew Churches and he has a beautiful website called Educational Origami. He also founded Global Digital Citizen Foundation. And this is his website and you can navigate it. Just look up Educational Origami. And so the, the second to the last slide that I'm gonna show you was this, which I'm excited to try. He actually has rubrics <laughs> that we could all adapt because we really, it helps to work with somebody else's rubric. So he has rubrics for digital taxonomy and for all the different Bloom's domains. So if anybody uses hypothesis or if we decided to do a collective project, it might be fun to do this as a group of classrooms, develop a rubric. And then, um, and so it's interesting that he has this global website because my student, uh, one of my students in the evaluation, and the students evaluated this uh, really highly, one of the students, John, who gave me permission to share his name, said this, and I know Marianne and I were very excited about this, a website like Hypothesis could serve to enhance the process of peer review, allowing for people from different regions of the world different areas of expertise to communicate and give feedback in real time. So I'm using this now in a case study debate team activity that I've constructed. I think we could collaborate on papers with this. And that was my last slide that I, I feel the real future opportunity is to build global classrooms. And especially in our next gen STEM scholars, global perspective. And again, my apologies for coming in late. No, I'm just so glad you did. <laughs> More than made up to it with all that. That's, That's just right. amazing stuff. Um, I, th I think we should, uh, maybe I'll just give two minutes to see if there's any kind of back and forth response at once going on. Elbow, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I'm, I have a lot to say about it. I'm really excited about it. But uh, Marianne, I'm do you so sorry. <laughs> Oh no! It's oh, so great. Brian, uh, Brian had one question that perhaps since we have the two college professors asking, um, is Brian still on? Or did he? Have yeah, one? yeah, I see him. <laughs> so you can ask your question yeah. yourself. But basically, what can he do at the K through 12 level to really start prepare his students for scientific literacy? I mean, it sounds like he's awfully you're doing an awful lot already. Okay. <laughs> but you what know, are you looking for? Our students get to do this, so I would say. You could, I did this with a, a primary literature paper, but you could do exactly the same thing with something like Discover Magazine, something that is directed towards the general public more so. You could do it in background material. I think it, you could use it, I could, I could imagine doing it in many different components. So I teach a large non majors human biology class that I love and I thought about doing it with that but I think I couldn't proctor it really well 130 there might be things going on that would be unfortunate <laughs> and so but I think if you have a classroom of 30 or under you could even take a digital textbook and have them highlight I don't get this term what is this and these are informative for us 
I do this at the end of class with postcards, the little cards. What didn't you understand? Or give me some keywords of the concepts. So you, we would get instant feedback about that. And so, I, I mean, this translates. I, I think if in a classroom, I might take Discover Magazine and then I set it up for rigor and reproducibility. This is huge in our area. But I would say for you, what I do with my non-majors who would be comparable to high school and elementary is, how is this relevant for your community? Really make that connection at first. So we read about a global explosion. How is this relevant? And have them make those connections. Yeah, would you, would you suggest the same for majors? Because I mean, working with higher level juniors and seniors in science classes, like what, what science, and this is something that we discussed before you were able to, to hop in a little bit, but are there literacy, scientific literacy skills that you see freshman major or sophomore majors deficient in that we can begin yes. to prepare them? And, and it's not just them, it's all students. We're having a huge conversation. And this is something I forgot in the slides, but was in there. So this can be expanded. And here's actually the opportunity. So thank you for saying this. It's the annotation of images and graphs. Yes, you got it. Yeah, that's so actually, exactly what Craig talked about. So Yeah, so I would say skip the text. Put a graph up and say, describe the graph to me. Or as a, as a group, what, what is this graph telling you? What is it not telling you? Have them do it in, in a graphic format or an image. Have them annotate a brain and, give, and make it fun. Make it fun. Say, okay, you're now in teams. How many can you annotate in the next minute? Something like that. Competitions are fun, friendly competitions. And now you've given me an idea for something to do in my non-majors class. Because I think this is what this, we need to have them think like scientists. Now, at the level of grad school, we hope <laughs> they can do a graph, but now maybe I should check. Uh, but certainly, um, yes, graph and image annotation. Which is uh, what Craig, I think, <laughs> was presenting on. I was very impressed Perfect. with Perfect. the, the oh, introductory okay. textbook that he was using yeah. that really is based on actual scientific data as opposed to interpretive figures of of what osmosis is. Yeah, you, we'll have to connect you guys so you can see the work that Craig was doing with, uh, with, with the, I'll let you go ahead, Craig, go ahead. Yeah. I think at the, the, the high school level, the, the most important thing to develop is the, the, the ability to read recursively. Um, my students coming in don't know how to, to read something once and then read it again. They think that if they've read it, they've read it and that's it. And the students that are struggling in my class are not reading and then going back in and, and, and really doing the, the sort of metacognition to go back in and say, this is where I need to look at again. Do you think annotation kind of organically helps that just by the virtue of the fact that you're reading the text, you're commenting on it, that's going to make you dig deeper, but going back and replying to or, or looking at other comments is going to just make you cycle through that text so many times or should. That's always what I thought was great about uh, teaching collaborative annotation was that, you know, they were constantly going back, especially if they start to get messages <laughs> that say, you know, Dr. Whippo commented on my annotation or my classmate just uh, annotated something. We don't quite have all those notifications set up, but once you get that notification system, my hope is that people will be going back to their biology textbook as much as they go to Facebook or <laughs> Twitter or Insta book or whatever they're doing now. I, I think the, 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 the biggest problem that I have is just students' attitudes towards assignments are that they're teacher games that you need to get through. And they just need to slow down and think about why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, I, I saw that as well. Um, and one, th one of my favorite things, especially at the high school level, because I was working on a master's degree at the same time was I would bring in my actual books, right, that are just filled with writing and showing them like, this is, it's a skill, you know, something you're gonna use outside of even biology, right? But it's something, the more you do it, the more you'll understand it. That's a kind of 
getting back to the public versus private group things, right, is that you can link annotation to annotation, right? So the recursiveness can definitely be scaffolded back into later concepts if we link back to old ideas and kind of force that discussion back to, if you don't remember what this is, maybe you should go read it again um, type thing. So I don't, I don't think I heard it. I don't think I've heard the words recursive reading put together, but I really like the image it conjures for me to help get it back to my students. Well, I think we should probably call it there. Uh, this has been an amazing conversation. Elba, I thank you so much for just jumping in when you could um, and making it happen because I'm, I'm just really glad your voice was part of this and your project got the full articulation. Um, I really do think, uh, I said this before you got on Elba, that maybe some, some point down the road with some NSF funding, we could talk about how to scale this from secondary to post-secondary to graduate uh, levels and, and you know talk about how people should be annotating at those different levels. And indeed, uh, I think Elba, you mentioned just this wonderful idea of maybe, I don't know, maybe this is how I read you, but you know, if, if some point Brian's students are annotating a text and your students were also on that text and possibly acting as the experts and answering some of those questions that were coming up, um, that would also be really cool to see some annotation across different levels. So thank you guys all much, so much for your work. I hope that we'll continue to share resources and projects and um, maybe move more formally for a collaboration to bring annotation across science and enhance scientific literacy. So mm -hmm. thanks everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everybody. Nice meeting you all. <laughs> thank you, participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.